This is the Nobel Podcast, where we talk about how to optimize your technology, life, and mind. We're joined by special operations veterans, entrepreneurs, investors, and others who have overcome difficulty to make it to the top of their craft by staying in the fight. All right, let's rock and roll. So we'll start off with what's your name and where'd you grow up? My name's uh, Chris Angarita. I grew up in Oak Park, Illinois, just a small town, about 20 minutes directly west of the city. Illinois, okay. And uh, where'd you go to school? Went to a few grade schools growing up, the longest one being uh, St. Giles, again, within Oak Park, uh, then went to high school in Oak Park as well, Fenwick High School. Did you, I always ask this question, especially with you guys, did you get in trouble a lot as a kid? What were you like as a... I actually wasn't a troublemaker. I was a pretty straight-laced kid, uh, studied, played a lot of sports growing up, fairly restless, but I never really got into any trouble per se. I was actually the, the, the one-off good kid. That actually surprised me. The teams. You seem like a reformed bad kid. So yeah. what sports did you play? Played soccer my whole life mm. and also ran track and field as a, as a sprinter and a pole vaulter. Did you go to college before that, Andy? I did, yes. I, I had the intent of being a SEAL since I was 12, whatever, for whatever reason that remained with me. High school, college, again, with the intent of enlisting as soon as I graduated. Did you play soccer in college? I didn't. I didn't. I should have, but I got too into... Yeah, enjoying college life <laughs> right. to do that. All right, so SEAL at 12, that's the earliest I've ever heard. I was, I think, like 15. A couple of guys are usually around there. Why, why 12? What did you see? What did you read? So always always a reader. Grew up, uh, my happy place was really libraries or bookstores growing up. So one day I was kind of you know, in the martial arts martial arts section of the, the library. Uh, I just happened to see, I, I still remember this, a book poking out. And it was the first nonfiction book, I believe, written about seals. It was the guys coming out of the water with the, the floppy hats on. I don't know if you remember that. The men in green Booting faces. Hats. It wasn't men in green faces. It was a book about, a nonfiction book about seals and train oh, pipeline. I don't remember the name of it. Saw that, pulled it out, read it, you know, front to, to front to back, and decided that's that's what I was going to do with my life. Well, I mean, what well, says so a 12 year old, super cool people with camouflage in war, guns getting after it. But what was it about that, that latched inside of your brain that young? I don't know. I think at that age, you know, there's, I'll be very frank, there's nothing to do with service or yeah. dedication to country at that age. I don't think you understand the import of those things till later on. But it was the idea that this looks really exciting. Jump out of planes, dive, shoot, blow stuff up. Uh, but also, it was a sense of like, this is, sounds like it's difficult and i w i wonder if i have what it takes to do this right and then joining that elite team turns out i'm afraid of heights and i don't particularly like diving <laughs> or being underwater but it was the right choice for me the height thing is funny so how many skydives do you have right now to your name uh, probably 700 700 you still afraid of heights yeah still afraid. that's amazing how yes. that's ironic so you said you you enlisted after college so can you go into the calculus behind why enlist versus why officer Although there weren't a lot of books written about SEALs at that time, I knew enough to know that if I wanted to do the job of a SEAL, e.g., you know, kind of be the first person in the door, be the guy to go into the different schools, tactical schools, whatever it is, I needed to go the enlisted route. I knew enough to know that as an officer, I'd be doing a very different job, an important job nonetheless, but a very different job, and it's just not the one that I wanted to do. When did you actually officially enlist? In 2000. So literally a year before 9-11. That's right. I was in first phase, I believe, when 9-11 happened. Okay. So you were, you were 21, 22 years old? Yeah, about 22. 22, first phase, 9-11 happens. Did that, you didn't go in for, for service. A lot of young guys don't. Contrary to that, it's more about the test, the, the ritual. W what did that do to you in first phase when you realized what happened on 9-11? It's interesting to see because you saw the shift from the instructor cadre from, because at the time, next to Buds was SEAL teams one, three, five. So you saw the activity happening. I mean, you saw guys patrolling the beaches, but there was this sense that everything had changed because prior to 9-11, really, we hadn't done much since Vietnam, right? Really, mm -hmm. at least any sustained combat. So there was a whole new mindset around what it's going to look like moving forward. And, and there was like this air of excitement in the air, really. I mean, it's as crazy as that sounds, guys now understood that they were going to do the job that they were trained to do. It's interesting from my perspective. So I went through Buds 2008. And that was already seven years into this thing. Like it was, was from day one. I was in 2008. We did 271? 
I could have been. Yeah. I don't. I got there in June of. Wait. I literally got to second phase. I think in June of oh, eight. So I must have just missed yeah. you. That's incredible. So that that was obviously very serious. Like I remember in, in Hell Week, I was low crawling. I was delirious. It was day five Hell Week, and my my butt was a little in the air. And one of the instructors, you probably know him, said, you know, "Get your fucking ass down," because if you don't, it might get shot off. So like it was never a doubt as to what we were doing and why it was serious. So I wonder. So when you were a student. What, what did it do to your own mind when you realized in first phase, 9-11 just happened, you were going through selection to become a Navy SEAL. Did that drive the point home you were going to be overseas right quick? 100%. The reality is you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know what you're getting yourself into, where we would be deploying, what we'd be doing. But there's an understanding that we're going to be doing something as soon as we got to the team. And I think everyone was excited about that. Because prior to that, like you were just going to hope that at, you know, when I make it through this pipeline that I'm going to see some form of action. But now it was, it was definitive. So when you went in, did you get a rate before you went to Buds? I did, yeah. At the time, you had to get a rate. So if anybody doesn't know what a rate is, it's your job in the Navy. So it could be a gunner's mate, an electrician's mate, whatever that is. So at that time, you had to go to A school first. So I went to gunner's mate school right after boot camp. It was like one of the shorter ones I could find. I think it was four months or something. It just sounded cool, although it was not. Did that and then straight to Buds right after, right after A school. So you read you know, the book or books before you got in. How did BUDS measure up to your expectations? I've heard a lot of you guys on podcasts talk about how you guys loved BUDS, how you found it and measured up to your expectations. I hated BUDS. I was a terrible <laughs> BUDS student. Hated every single day of it. I found nothing. I've heard several people at this point refer to BUDS as beautiful in some form or fashion. I hated every minute of it. Didn't find it beautiful. <laughs> I it terrible. I hated it. I was, I was terrible. I was not a good runner, not a good swimmer, not a good heel course. Uh, I think it was Dusty was talking about the second time. I was a third time, every time guy, right? So every major test that you had to do in order to progress, you get three tries for the people that don't know that. I was the guy that passed on that third try every time, always on the edge of getting kicked out of buds. Mike, are you goon squad a lot? Uh, All all the time, all the time. So the harder, not smarter pathway. That's right. All right. So you go through buds, West Coast teams, East Coast teams. Yep. Started on the West Coast, SEAL Team 1. Went right there, did several deployments, um, SEAL Team 1 after that. Made my way to Buds. It's just talked about 2008. I was there for about three years. Where did you deploy when you were at Team One? Two, two times to Iraq. The first two to Iraq. Were they pretty kinetic? They, they were. The first one was we were doing a lot of direct action missions. Uh, we did that with the the Polish Grom as well. That morphed into doing the PSD missions, so protective services for the president, prime minister, and the two vice presidents of Iraq. So we kind of split the deployment cool. going that. So the first half was more exciting than the second half for sure. And then the following deployment was uh, back to Iraq and more kinetic type operations. So if you had to sum up your Team One experience overseas, w- what were your favorite aspects? And then compare that to the worst aspects. I think for me, I mean, doing the PSD mission was a little disheartening just because we wanted to be doing the kinetic stuff. That's there's really what you want to do when you join, right? That's what you have. That's what you envision. That's what you train to. So moving over to the PSD mission, not as kinetic. Certainly, looks a lot of standing around waiting for you know some of these VPs to get out of their meetings or whatever it is. Not as interesting. So that was it. Was a great learning experience. You know, I we we had a great group of dudes of the team, so I enjoyed that. But not as interesting as the first half of that deployment. The second deployment was a lot more interesting. Again, going out almost every night, hitting houses, and I, I just enjoyed doing that kind of work, but the planning that goes to, goes into any one of those missions, getting the team together, figuring out who's going to be doing what on target, rehearsing that over and over, and then executing it, coming, you know, getting that intel off target, processing all that data, figuring out what's next, and then hitting, you know, the next place the next night. That cycle was just, there's, there's just something great to it. Let's dig into that for a minute, because you reminded me of some stuff in the past that when it initially starts off, Things feel a little edgy, a little uncomfortable, unsmooth. Yeah. And then over time, it. you get into the rhythm. You start iterating, A-B testing, yep. things get better. Can you talk about how that improved over time through those direct action missions? What got better? Why did it get better? How did the mindsets change? The reality is leadership at the time, too, hadn't had any combat experience, right? So my first deployment to Iraq, this was my leadership, my chiefs, our LTs, also first deployment to a combat zone. So... It was, it was a pretty steep learning curve, right? We would turn over with the, the departing SEAL team that we would turn over with and try to get as many of their SOPs as we could that we, we just determined were working for them. 
But at the end of the day, it was a lot of iteration, like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have landed that close to the target. Right. Right. We got lit up as soon as we landed. Maybe, probably should think about this a little bit differently the next one. So it was a lot of learning, but developing new tactics on the fly while we were yeah, getting back into combat after you know, a stagnant period. So your leadership probably didn't have any actual combat experience, actual firefight experience. Right. What was that learning curve like, if there even was one? Was it just a smooth fit, or did that have to take some uh, tempering? No, it was a pretty smooth fit. At the end of the day, we trained to all those scenarios, and we trained for all those contingencies. So the fact that, you know, you know my chief or tenor or whatever it was had never fired a shot in anger was immaterial, hmm. right? Because they knew what they were supposed to do on target, right? They hadn't done it before, which is fine, but they knew what they needed to do, and, and they did a great job. So let's go back to Buzz as an instructor. If there's one thing I'd regret, it's not going back and being an instructor. First phase, yeah. that, so first phase of Buzz is, first, can you explain what first phase of Buzz is? And then two, how did it change your view of Buzz itself since you had kind of a more miserable yeah. experience in yeah. Buzz yeah. and yeah. add a little bit more meaning to it after a couple of war deployments? We had a great group of cadre there. Everybody kind of takes on a different role when you're there, right? There's the nice guy, the hugger, there's like the, the guy... The nice guy roles were already taken, so that wasn't me for sure. But everybody there was extremely professional. And when you're a student, you don't see that, right? You see these psychopaths in front of mm -hmm. you trying, literally trying to kill you, it seems like at the time. When you go back there as an instructor, what you realize is that everything is really well scripted, right? First phase, for anyone that doesn't know, is the first real phase of SEAL training, right? You'll, there's a pre-phase that doesn't really count, but there's three phases in BUDS. First phase, which is... Uh, the physical conditioning phase, that's where hell week is generally in the third or fourth week. The second phase is dive phase. And then the third week is land warfare demolition phase. So I was an instructor in first phase, which entails hell week. And this is really the kind of the crucible for most of my students. This is where we're going to lose most of the candidates. They're going to, from DORs or uh, injuries as well, right? Once they make it past first phase, the vast majority of them are going to graduate. So that's to, to go back. That's where I was. But I, what I realized is nothing at buzz was an accident right we had a detailed plan for every day especially hell hell week is scripted down to the minute i never As i never would have known you that. don't know that no. you know for the water tables the, you know the length of time that we can expose a student to water at what temperature depending on the wind temperature as well mm. right so all of that comes into play and you realize it's just like a a very well oiled machine when you're on the back side of it you don't see that as a student right it looks like complete chaos and that they're really trying to hurt you that's not the case at all so knowing that on the back end, what was your relationship with the students like? Was there ever a point where you're like, you almost pity them? You're almost sorry they have to go through this hell? Did you savor it? What was your mindset like throughout that? I never pitied anyone, no. Because I never felt that myself as a student, and nor would I want anyone to pity me. I was fairly tough instructor. I think I was fair, though. That said, you know, when a student decides... There's no malicious intent from any of the instructors there, right? Uh, we take on different roles, as I said, but uh, the moment a student decides that they're going to quit, which is the vast majority of them, is it's a very like empathetic conversation we have with all those students when they're out processing. Like, hey, man, what's how are you doing? First of all, you doing all right? You know, what was the reason for for wanting to to drop out? And we just kind of talk them through, let them know it's okay. There's an opportunity to come back in the future if that's ever something that they want to do. But we want to let them know that it's okay. There's, you know, this is this happens all the time. It doesn't reflect anything about your about you as a, as a person or as a man or anything. It's just not for everybody at a certain point in their life. And you may come back at another point and, and just kill it. So I'm curious from your perspective, Buds instructor. A lot of arguments have been made to make Buds easier for any number of reasons. What is your perspective on the and even just the general concept of making it easier in any way, shape, or form to get more people through? Yeah, nothing revelatory here. I mean, by dropping standards, we'd be doing a disservice to the community and to people who actually need to go overseas and do the job, right? There have been, while I was an instructor, several attempts to make some of the evolutions a little bit easier. Mm. We always pushed back to the extent that we could, but those generally come down from you know, the admirals, et cetera, because attrition's too high. Manning, there's a man, there was a manning shortage mm. at the time, so we needed to push more people through the pipeline in order to fill the teams. So it was a constant struggle to figure out how do we increase pipeline while maintaining the standard and not watering down the training. What was your role? It was, was a the asshole, basically? Yeah, if you want to call that. I was one of those, yes. 
<laughs> right. Which that, is not my personality. At all. <laughs> I was just about to ask. Was that uncomfortable for you? It was. It was. And you, you learn to kind of play that character. And that's what it is. Yeah. And I took it very seriously. You know, I, I took the job very seriously. Very professional group of guys I worked with. But it's, it's unnatural to me. I don't yeah. like yelling. I don't like raising my voice. So it was, I got into it after a while. And I, <laughs> I, I, I took on the role, uh, but certainly not something that's normally aligned by my personality. All right. So you did West Coast Deployment Star Rock. You did the Buds. What happened yep. after Buds? After Buds, um, you know, I was actually contemplating getting out hmm. during Buds. I was somewhat disillusioned with my third deployment with PI, and it was kind of I didn't find it a very interesting deployment. We did a few things here and there. So I went to Bud's. I just wanted to downshift, take a break, figure out what was next. I considered actually getting out at that point. Somebody um, from Dev Group was an instructor there uh, with me. And he just said, you should really consider screening for development group. I think you would do well there. Uh, and you'd really enjoy yourself over there. Up to that point, I had not spent any time thinking about it. I didn't know anybody over there. I didn't really have any friends there. I didn't Nobody really talked about it that much uh so he kind of gave me the scoop on what dev group was and convinced me that i had kind of the the ability to to do well there and i screened i was selected and went there in, in 2011 so this is the first time we're bringing this up on the podcast at least can you give an overview of what what dev group is yeah development group is the tier one arm of naval special warfare it's typically the unit that's reserved for High profile missions like hostage rescue, counter WMD, weapons mass destruction, and then higher, higher HVT level, uh, direct action missions. How many deployments did you do when you went over to Danmark? Uh, I think six or seven over there. Six or seven, all Middle East, Africa. Yeah. And then some in other places that were not in, uh, yeah. combat zones. Yeah. What, uh, so I forgot to ask, did you have like a specialty? Were you a sniper? Were you a drink? I did a lot of, uh, what we would call special activity stuff. I started that when I was a team one. Mm. So that would entail things like physical, technical surveillance, and right? How do we, one, follow somebody, then get the intel from their home, their phone, their computer in order to exploit that intelligence, use that intelligence for a follow on mission. That's a lot of deployments. So like maybe summarize. What were some of the best experiences you had? Maybe one, two, or three, and then we'll go to some of the worst experiences, some of the the more eye opening experiences. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Right, which ones I could talk about? So I think one, just the best experience of that command is there's a just different level of professionalism, ability, and experience that that I didn't see prior to that. And that's obviously a function of a number of different things, right? There's another selection process. You have guys that are typically older. You had guys that were since the war started doing these really high profile missions in a really intense battle rhythm, right? Going out two to three times a night, sometimes mm -hmm. every single night on deployment, right? So they gained a ton of experience and changed the tactics that NSW now uses at combat. You know, we went from this dynamic, what we call kind of hostage rescue move, going very fast into these buildings to clear them, realizing that guys were getting shot in the door quite a bit doing that because they weren't protecting themselves prior to making entry. So we shifted to what we call an out methodical clearance, which is taking a little bit more time at the door, using that threshold to just act as effectively a, a barrier against bullets coming in, clear 90% of that room for make, make entry and then make our entry, right? So going over there is just a, a massive mind shift as far as, you know, how the best people in the world are doing this kind of thing. And you're allowed to be very specially, very focused when you're there on the you know, at SEAL Team 1, you're doing all kinds of different training missions, right? You're doing diving, you're doing SR, you know, surveillance reconnaissance, you're doing, you know, you're doing all these different things. You're kind of a jack of all trades. When you go over to, to command at Damneck, you are really a master of one, which is doing CQB, close quarters battle. Mm -hmm. And that is what you do day in, day out. Every day. So it's, it's Naval Special Warfare Development Group. So it's not just kicking indoors. You guys are constantly thinking, constantly innovating. So that the example of CQC is phenomenal. So I remember that shift coming down from you guys to, to the training I was going through. Can you give like a more concrete run through for people who don't know the difference between a dynamic room clearance and then, you know, the sneaky peaky kind of room clearance you guys kind of evolved it into? Yeah, a dynamic clearance means we're, we're stacked four guys at the door or whatever the number is. And as soon as we, that breacher makes door, if the first person opens that door, everybody's rushing in, right? They, they have predetermined positions based on their number in that stack. 
but they're going in without any thought. I mean, I don't say without any thought, but it's very quick. They're not pausing at the doorway. Early in Iraq, the enemy was positioning themselves to shoot directly at the door. As soon as that door opened, they were waiting for us and guys were getting killed at the door. They knew the tactics. They, they knew the tactics, right? So what we transitioned to is called combat clearance or methodical, which is take a little bit more time in the door. We're going to pie the door, basically use the edge of the, the wall, the, the frame of the door as a bullet trap effectively, clear as much as we can, as slowly as we can, peeking into the room effectively, clearing as much of that room as we can before we make entry to make sure there's no threats inside. Then once 90% of that room is cleared, you know, now we just have really effectively the corners to, to take care of. The evolution of the combat tactics are literally written in blood. Yep. Like that is the most high stakes A-B testing in the world. It is. So one thing you told me before too, I want to cover is like, th there's two ways to go about a career. There is the, I want to make the highest rank I can as fast as I can. And then there's the other approach where like you, you love being on the ground. Yep. You love being boots on the ground and you make a different career choice. You want to talk about like the difference between the two and the choice you made? There are folks that are more rank focused, mm -hmm. right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they see that as a career. They want to rise as high as, high as they can rank wise into the military. No issues with that. I was more interested in just doing the job and finding things that were interesting to do. I think people have a concept of you know, if you're a SEAL or a Ranger or SF, you're just kind of doing one job your entire career, which is not the case at all, right? There's opportunities to learn all kinds of new skill sets, go to different teams, different units, and do something new every few years. And that was more interesting to me than staying in one place and, you know, and trying to kind of effectively climb that ladder as fast as possible. Again, nothing wrong with that. It just wasn't where my interests lied. Yeah. So you were, you were operational the entire time, basically. Buds. I had buds. And then my last three years after development group, I moved out to New England, and I did my last three years as the the special warfare coordinator to New England. So I was working for the recruiting district. You know, a kid comes into the recruiting district, says, I want to be a SEAL, oh, a diver, a SWIC. They get sent to me. I work with those those prospective candidates, uh, see if they have kind of the bare minimum things to, to pass requirements, start working with them to, to pass the initial screening test they need to get selected. To, they need to pass in order to get selected to respective pipelines. And they would get picked up for those, those, their respective pipelines, whether that's BUDS or EOD training, yeah. et cetera. So that was my last three years. That's a fun way to finish. It was, it was great. I wonder, the, the community is uh, such that people, they pursue the fight. They constantly want to get the big mission. They constantly want to find themselves in the thick of it. And like, I have trouble articulating that for myself, but you've been doing it for, you did seven, eight, nine deployments, 20 years. What, 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 what is it to pursue the fight can you articulate what that, that, that primal impulse is that keeps people trying to be operational? Obviously there's an excitement to it, right? There's almost an addictive quality to, to going overseas and mm -hmm. doing that job. Not objectively good or bad. It just is what it is. There's always a part of that. It's just like that. Well, what is, what that is adrenaline. addicting? What is addicting? Not besides the adrenaline, what else has it that's addicting? I don't know if I've any, ever spent any time thinking about this deep Blake. You spent 20 years doing it. That yeah, was I know. Ironic, I know. I mean, I suspect it's this subconsciously this idea that this could be the last thing that I ever do and I need to be on point if I want to go home after this session. I think that's probably running in the background at some at some level. That's so good. That's so good. Do you, do you miss it? I do miss it. it. The reality is you can't do that job forever, right? At some point you have to make that mental shift that this is no longer a viable career for me because I'm too old or whatever it is. I'm, you know, I'm, my rank is too high that I can no longer be the on the ground guy. I do miss it. Really what I miss is, is the people, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what I loved about the job. Again, nothing new here. Any, every guy you talk to that came from the military, it's really the, the people that we miss once we leave. The people who were operating towards common objective, very little self-regard for promotion or self-promotion. Uh, everybody's working on the page, same page, and everyone is continuously trying to get better. I, I just, that culture is is addicting in and of itself. It's a freight train. It is. I mean, do you miss it? Uh, yeah, every day. Yeah. Yeah. What do you miss about it? Uh, I would say that I'm interviewing you here. <laughs> I, I miss the mission. I miss the clarity. I miss the way you phrase it, the last thing I ever do. That is, there's something like savagely, ancestrally <laughs> primal about that. It is so deeply satisfying. And like you said, when you were a kid, you're 12 years old. There's a reason why I think so many 
young men look to something like Buzz because something's not being fulfilled mm -hmm. and that at that primal ritualistic level. Yeah. I mean, this goes into a deeper conversation, which is like as a kid, I felt like I always had to prove myself probably growing up as a father, not a very good father, somebody who wasn't very emotionally attached to his children, uh, never really said, like, I love you or, hey, good job. So I think a part of me was always seeking validation throughout my whole life. So I've always, I've done well wherever I was. And it's probably a part of that. If I had to psychoanalyze myself is I was in seeking that validation. I want other people to say, hey, good job. Interesting. I think that's probably why I took to it that early. Interesting. All this went on 20 years of that, hitting it as hard as you possibly could. What was the inciting moment, I suppose, when you realized you were going to transition out of the military? I made this decision that at 20 years, I was going to stop. I felt like that was a good round number, get my retirement, but also I wanted to be young enough to do other things, right? other interesting things. I say this all the time. I had no foresight into what I would be doing, but it's interesting stuff with good people. I didn't care what industry that was, what role that was, fairly agnostic when it comes to that. I just wanted to do interesting work with good people. So made that decision that I was going to transition in that last three years where I was the, the special warfare coordinator in England. You know, one of the reasons I took that job too is just to be able to downshift a little bit, especially, you know, coming from where I came from, spend more time with the kids. But just think about transition too. Like, what am I good at, right? What do I want to, what's interesting to me? Did my MBA while I was there as well? Let's just kind of check the box and, you know, maybe learn a little bit of the language of business. Um but I didn't really know what I was going to do, just that I wanted to do something else. So digging into the transition, this is huge for everybody who's been in the military, who's in the military thinking about getting out. It is, it is hard. And everybody, there's a lot of similarities within a lot of differences too. So I'm curious, for your transition, we, we talked a little bit about the whole ritualistic piece, the satisfying that primal urge for danger, riding up right against that line of death. When you transitioned out after 20 years of doing that, what, what were some of the biggest battles you had to face? Probably nothing unique here, but it's the loss of community, hmm. right? You Once you leave the community, it's gone, right? That train keeps moving and it's hard to keep in contact with people because they're busy, the folks that are still in anyways. You probably are moving to a new location. That was my case. So leaving Virginia Beach where that you know I had that community, in the moment you leave, one, you just miss the people and you no longer have that direct connection every day. Because at the end of the day, every single day we went to work with our best friends. And then you leave that and now you're in a totally different environment with people who have, in many cases, very different values that you do, right? Now you go to the corporate world if that's what it is. And you have folks who are more, more conditioned to think about promotion mm -hmm. and how do I climb this ladder than about working towards a common objective. And that can be really discouraging for a lot of people getting out. It's like, wow, this is very different. The excitement, I was okay leaving that behind. At the end of the day, I, I can find excitement doing other things. But it was that, that sense that I, I lost kind of a, a portion of my family, if you will. Do you still feel it? All the time. Yeah, all the time. Which is, I say, you know, one of the most important things guys can do, guys and girls can do when they transition out of the military is stay in contact with folks. Every day, you know, it doesn't have to be every day, but I've gotten better over the last couple of years just reaching out to buddies and be like, hey, what's going on? I'm just sending texts back and forth just to check in, see how guys are doing, getting on a phone call, talking to somebody, you know, on the phone, actually, and just seeing how they're doing. And that was a way for me to just stay connected. And I think it's an important thing for anybody, you know, battling different issues as they get out, especially guys who have been doing this for a long time. You know, there, there's certain things you have to deal with psychologically. And being able to reach back out to folks and connect with them. We kind of got like a little ancestral tangent. So I kind of want to yeah. plumb that depth a little bit more. But when you when you look at the, some of the priest tribes, the warriors were fully integrated within the village. Mm -hmm. they, their wives, their children, their cousins, they all experienced the combat literally alongside the warrior. Yeah, The whole thing was integrated. In the SEAL teams, it, it is literally completely separated. There's a complete line of demarcation and there's a complete separation of personal and work of the right. war yep. of the peace, which I think makes the transition that much harder. And it creates almost like a, a dual self. And for my part, and for a lot of people's part, there's that conflict of selves when you get out, like what, what does this mean now for me to be yeah. Chris Angarita as opposed to the team player, the team guy? Yeah. Did you, did you experience that? Well, let me ask you as a seal, did you feel that when you left, like my identity was a seal? 
I would not have admitted it while I was in the, the teams, but I painfully learned that the answer is yes when yeah. I got out. Yeah. I think I, I was able to shed some of that early mm-hmm. on. I think when I was young, certainly, you know, you know, when you're young, I think that's just a function of youth. It's like you get attached to this thing. It's elite. It's exciting. It's well-respected. You get, you get kind of addicted to that, you know, I don't know, the, the cachet of it, I guess. I think I shed that a little bit later as mm-hmm. I as I gained a little bit of maturity. So I never, I don't want to say never, but I didn't wrap my identity around being a sailor. It's like I loved my job, but I realized it was just a job. And the moment I leave, nobody's going to care because somebody's going to fill in my spot and that train keeps moving. No. Right. So I, I think I did a pretty good job of not intertwining Chris with Seal early on. That said, you know, you still miss those things when you leave, right? And it's to me, it was just more about community. That's a phenomenal, like, psychological feat. That, that requires yeah. a tremendous amount of introspection. So wh- where did you go? Where was the first place you worked after the military? So uh, as soon as I left, I started working at Microsoft. I had a, f- a friend that worked there, said, hey, you, you, might, you might really enjoy it over here. I was on the federal side of the business. He was in business development. He said, you'd like the team. You'd like the folks here. So... I started interviewing, got hired shortly thereafter. So my first job was was at Microsoft, doing business development type stuff. Was that a surprise to you that you ended up at Microsoft, like a major corporation after doing what you were doing? I don't know that anything could have surprised me. The reality is you don't know what you don't know mm-hmm. when you're in and what the outside world is supposed to look like or where you fit in or where you have the aptitude or the right cultural values to fit in. So I was just happy to to go to a what I thought was a great company, and that it is a great company. So I was happy to to be there. I learned a ton there. I just learned that it probably wasn't the place that I wanted to stay forever. Culture is extremely important to me. There are great people there. I, I still have friends from there. The value alignment I don't think was there for me, and and I knew when I got out, culture was going to be very important. At the end of the day, I think you can find a good culture anywhere. But there's just some things that were missing. You know, the people that have similar experiences as you kind of speak the same language. But again, going back to the same things, like working towards a common mission and very little self-regard for me or for promotion. I I think I missed that a little bit. So uh, I learned a ton there, had a good time, but I knew that after a couple of years, I was going to be going looking somewhere else. Did you you use sales at Microsoft initially? What, what, so what drew you to sales? And I'm asking from the perspective of what your specialty was in the teams. You kind of had the secret squirrel kind of thing going on there. Was that, was that part of the aspect of sales? I don't think so. I think it just fell into it. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, um, I had somebody who was already working in Microsoft who explained what the job was to me. It sounded interesting enough. And that's what I was looking for. Something interesting mm-hmm. that was going to be dynamic, changing every day. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot and was fortunate to, to learn from some really good people there. But I think like a lot of guys, when they get out, they just fall into things. Uh, we plan and plan and plan and go to school for different things with the intent of doing something specific. The reality is we just kind of fall into certain things. So like you, I had no intentions of getting into the, the current occupation. Yeah. So I wonder, what, what do you think about sales, like conceptually, philosophically? But mo- I think most people, when they think of sales, will think of like a used car salesman or something like that. Sales, I, I realize the hard way is, is a very different job. It is a I'm not going to get my reasons on it. What are your reasons for liking sales? What do you get out of it? What's the satisfaction? I enjoy having those conversations with with the customer. And it's always an exercise in problem solving, right? Every time you're on a call talking in a meeting, you are trying to get to the core of a customer's problem and understand with, with questions, you know, whether there's a big enough problem here for you to solve. And sometimes the customer doesn't even know that they have a problem or they can't pinpoint what that problem is. Hmm. So trying to figure that out together, to me, is an interesting just academic exercise. So one thing I know about you is you're one of the most voracious readers I've ever met. This kind of ties into most of the stuff we've talked about so far. So just to kick it off, why do you read with such intensity? The word intensity implies effort. And I've been reading since I was a kid. My house uh, growing up, was always filled with books. Both my parents were readers. There's an attic in our house and a glass case. I just, I, I always remember this with you know, first editions of 
Chekhov and Dostoevsky and Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And I would just go up there and, and read all those from a pretty, pretty young age. And for whatever reason, whether it's a, a combination of like polygenic traits or environment, that stayed with me. I've just enjoyed That was always my happy place is the kind of with a book for whatever reason, it, you know, I've maintained that interest, but I read for a few reasons. One is just because I enjoy it. And it's a way to break away from the real world and immerse yourself in something new. General Mattis said this, and I'm sure you know the quote, which is, you know, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate because your personal experiences are not enough to sustain you. I love it. We could, we could argue about the first part of that, whether you're functionally illiterate, if you haven't read hundreds of books, but the cert, I think the second part is certainly true by definition your experience is an n of one right and how do you how do you scale that right and if there's an easy way to do that is rely on the experiences of other people who've gone before you and done the things that you might be interested in whatever you might be interested in there's a book about it and if you want to learn about the, the world around you and the people who inhabit it you can find that in the book so i'm interested in the world around me and the people that i walk with every day so like from my own experience, re reading is one thing. And there's a lot of people who could read a lot of books real fast, but then it just kind of goes in one side of the brain, out the other. Mm -hmm. How do you actually tie it together? Do you have a method for abstracting out the value from each book and then actually applying it to your life? Yes. There are no ways to do this if you're right. I think a lot of people read quickly and to get through books as it's kind of how many books can I get through in an X period of time in a year? And that's kind of a trophy for them. I, I read fairly slowly and I mark up books all the time. And then I write in the indents because writing forces you to think about what you're reading and put that on paper and it just helps retain that information. So I'm constantly, and I'll do synopses after each chapter as well for a lot of nonfiction books just so I understand it. And then I'll go back to that book a week or two later and look at those again to make sure I'm re-ingraining that in my brain. Mm. So like when I'll, I'll try to do something similar when I read. I'll try to write down like one or two, maybe three things yeah. and try to like carry it with me, almost on yeah. a note card. Yeah. Do you, do you try that method? That's like the, the Ryan Holiday method, right? Where yeah. he's got a note card. For every book he's read, he's got multiple note cards with whether they're quotes that he found interesting in the book, the big ideas, and he's got a whole, you know, box full of different note cards, oh my different God. genres, right? Thousands yeah. of thousands of those. But I think that's a good way to do that. But I most of that made stays in the book itself, in the end of the chapter, in the margins. So you mentioned you write, you take notes from reading. Your books are marked up. Do you do you write? Do you write for personal essays? Do you keep a journal? I do. I write. Yeah, I think writing is a forcing function for clarity and concision, and I would argue that. You don't know what you believe or why you believe it until you've put it down on paper. I love it. Right. Writing forces you to think about the things that you think about and to make them concrete. Until then, they're just these ethereal, you know, notions running around your head. And putting them on paper requires you to think about what you actually believe. What's your method? Do you use a pen and paper? Do you pen use your laptop? Always pen and paper, always. You keep a notebook, like is it a I daily do, blog? Yeah, I journal. yeah. And, and then, I use that for two different journaling is is its own separate thing. You know, anytime you're, I think it's a it's a useful exercise for anyone. Anytime you're feeling anxiety, fear, whatever it is, elation, whatever it is, put it down on paper. Hmm. Right. The second is just interesting things that I might have seen that I may want to write about in, a, in an essay form, but I you know it's not that formal just things to help me solidify my own thinking. There are a certain time of day you do the journaling? Morning. Every morning. If I'm traveling, I'm not really good about yeah. it. Uh, when I'm home, I'm, I'm fairly assiduous about doing that. So wake up is, I've had a meditation practice for 12 years, probably. That meditation, reading, writing. So you, you read in the morning as well? I do. Let's walk through this routine. Yeah. So you wake up, meditation. What kind of meditation do you do? Some Vipassana type meditation. So I'm just sitting there. There's a couple of different ones I'll do, but a body scan one is mm. then just following the breath is another. At a certain time period? For 20 minutes. 20 minutes of breathing focus. Yeah. Little body scan. Yeah. Uh, 12 years? I've had that for, yeah, yeah, about 12 years. So you started doing it in the teams? I did, yeah. Inter it's not normal. 
Is it? I found that when I went over to when I worked to development group, there's a full time sports psychologist that we had on staff there. Mm-hmm. She incredible. But you know, so I would go there and just talk to her about different things and like, um, okay, I hate jumping. You know, how do you help me get over <laughs> hitting thing in the air and jumping out of an airplane? And she's the one that really turned me on one to different breathing protocols, but also meditation. Yeah. And so that seems helpful. And she had said, you know, a lot of guys at the command are doing it. And if there's anything that could give me, you know, another fraction percent of an edge, I was willing to try it. And for whatever reason, that stuck with me as well. That's a, so okay. So about 20 minutes of meditation. How long do you then journal and read for? It depends on how much time I have, you know, what, I, what else I have to do in the morning. Generally, I try to get up at six. That's changed recently. But uh, I try to get up at six to do all those things. Writing could be depending on what I'm writing. The journal could just take five minutes. If you're ruminating over something that's causing stress, anxiety, there's a magic solution. I could just put it on paper, trap it on that piece of paper, yeah. paper, get it out of your head. That's been the biggest benefit for me with journaling. So it might just be five minutes. If there's something I'm thinking about that I feel like I need to help clarify my thinking, it might be 15, 20, 30 minutes to math. And then reading, how long do you do that in the morning? It depends how much time I've spent doing the other things. Uh, I try to read for two hours a day. That's not always. Oh, wow. That's awesome. It's in the morning at night. It's not always doable. Yeah. That's my, that's my goal. So besides the meditation, the journaling, the reading, what do you do anything else to like get yourself ready to prime yourself for the day? Or is that like the agenda? No, the agenda happens the night before. I'm telling you, I'm listing out my, my priorities for the next day, the night before. This goes into how we think about time and how we use time. But the reality is the, the vast majority of what we do on any given day is unimportant. So if we can think about the things that are going to move the needle ahead of time and focus intensely on those things, you're going to make progress. It, it, like invariably you're going to make progress instead what a lot of people do is every day they've they realize that they've done a lot of things but they've gotten nothing accomplished yep. and because it's hard in corporate and start startup especially you have slack messages coming in emails coming in everything is designed to distract you from your job right so how do you think about what's important and then how do you focus rel- relentlessly on those two things while trying to ignore all the distractions i'm certainly not perfect at it I, you know, I succumb to, you know, responding to Slack, you know, as soon as somebody sends a message all the time, like, so I have to just turn it off and that's a forcing function for focusing on the thing that I'm doing. What does the nightly routine look like? Is there a certain agenda you have, a way you approach it? No, I'm just, I have my, my notebook that I put everything in and tasks for the day, whatever it is, my, my schedule the night before, typically I'll write out the, you know, the two to three big things I need to do the next day. I like that the night before. I've never done that before. When it comes down to like building your schedule, blocking off time, time for emails, time for decompression, how do you approach that? So besides the night and the morning, how do you approach that throughout the day to make sure you're kind of optimal? I think it's important. Time blocking is a hack. Setting aside time for deep work. And Cal Newport talks about this mm-hmm. all the time, right? It's so easy, like I said, to just get distracted. So okay. putting, blocking that hour, that two hours to do whatever it is that's going to meet, move the needle for whatever your role is, is critical. Everything else can be done. So I think using the Eisenhower matrix is always a useful frame, framework for that. I don't know what that is. You know, Eisenhower matrix on one axis, you have urgency, less urgent, more urgent. And then on the Y axis, you have importance, mm-hmm. less important, more important. And you can determine what needs to be done, what we really need to focus on, depending where the intersection of those, those things lie. So very urgent, very important needs to happen right away, for example. So I have the Eisenhower matrix written up to Google it, look, okay. take a look at it. I have it on a whiteboard. It's just a reminder. Like, is this thing that I'm doing right now important? And the reality is most of the time it's not. I like that a lot. I'm going to use that one. How do you get your best work? Before you even do that, you brought up Slack, and I, I constantly wonder about Slack. Yeah. It is a double-edged sword, yeah. and I'm almost wondering if it's actually worse than it is good. And I, I say that because... You talk about deep, deep work, like getting into a flow state, actually getting a consistent strain of thought for a long period of time. Slack is deliberately designed to break that. 100%. Any second of any day. And you're constantly task switching throughout the day. Yeah. Which we know is detrimental. Yep. I almost wonder, like, what company would have the the audacity to say, you know what, we're going to stop Slack for three months to see if it increases pro- like productivity. It's one of those things you have, it, you almost feel morally obligated to use it. And you become dependent on it. 
how else do we communicate if not through yeah. Slack? Do you manage Slack? Like you say, you'll answer like a late night Slack message. How do you, how do you manage it? I manage it better after hours than I do during the day. Uh, and I'm it's, it's something I fight with every single day. It's like, ah, so do I, do you respond to this right away? It just came in. Oh, another Slack. I wonder who this yeah. is from when I'm trying to do something that's going to actually move the needle. Like I talked about. So work in progress after work. I'm pretty diligent about being focused on, you know, after work stuff, yeah. whether it's kids, hobbies, whatever that is. I, I deliberately don't slack after five thirty it's for that exact time. reason because I don't want anybody to feel like they need to they need to respond. Yeah. Like it, if it's important enough, pick up the phone and call me. Yeah. And we'll actually address it. If not, it could wait twelve hours. Like that that's I wish I had a good answer. I don't. Yeah. It's worth thinking about. I think everyone's gonna be thinking about it soon enough. How do you get your best work done? Do you have some sort of music in the background? Do you have techno blasting in a certain location? Do you you set intentions? I know that for sure, but how do you think about that? Depends on what I'm doing for the day. Music, I'll, I'll typically have music in the background, uh, classical or just yeah. sometimes just white noise. Um, I think having that kind of external signals to me is, puts me in a calming state. It actually helps me focus. I'll do that. Typically, if I don't have a ton of calls, I'll do that at a coffee shop so just to get outside and change the environment. I think changing the environment is really important mm -hmm. just to do better, just to do your best work. Other than that, it's turning turning off Slack every once in a while so I can do the, the real work. So what, what about working out? So you're, you're obviously physical. You're still physical. Do you have a philosophy behind your workout program, a, a time of day to do it? How do you think about it? I used to do that first thing in the morning. I've pivoted to doing that later after work now. My philosophy, at, if I'm 46 now, so the philosophy is try to maintain strength and try to prevent myself from breaking too early and just make staying healthy uh, yeah i'm not trying to pr or anything i'm not trying to win any bench press contests i just want to stay healthy and mobility i focused more and more on mobility as, as you get older everything hurts a little bit more and tightens up so i think that's just critical in maintaining good health and and being as pain-free to the extent that you can be pain-free as you can you follow up anybody's workout program do you make up your own stuff i make up my own stuff i think it's named kelly starrett has a lot of good mobility. Supple Leopard guy. Yeah, Supple Leopard guy. He just read his latest book, 10 Habits, but a lot of good mobility stuff there that I try to be pretty diligent about as well. Not always great, but it's something that's more and more important to me. What are three books that would change people's lives? I think there's a book called Awareness, The Perils and Opportunities of Reality by Anthony DeMello. It's a book about understanding the nature of mind understanding the stories that we tell ourselves and shedding some of the illusions that we maintain on any, any given day, like who I am, right? I'm just the person that's introverted or I'm the person that's not good at this, right? These are effectively all stories that we tell ourselves. And the reality is we're not any one of those things, right? These are just thoughts that pop into our conscious mind and we run with them. So how do we realize when those thoughts are making themselves into the, the conscious mind and learn that we don't have to be a slave to those thoughts or emotions. We can actually choose our own path. It sounds like a logical approach to meditation, almost like a constant awareness. And that's why you meditate is one, to realize when that thought is presenting itself, right? Mm -hmm. When anger presents itself. Typically, you're just going to run with that feeling. That guy cuts you off in traffic. You know, your first reaction is to flip him off and then it, it just ruins your day for the next 30 minutes, hour, six hours. Where meditation has helped me is realizing when that emotion presents itself. Victor Frank talked about this, which is between stimulus and response, there's the ability to choose, hmm. right? There's space. In that space, there's ability to choose. And in that choice you make is the opportunity for growth. And I think that's right. Realizing that as soon as a stimulus presents itself, a thought, emotion, and it finds its way into the conscious mind that you don't have to react to it. Right? You don't have to be a passenger in that vehicle. You can go your own direction, right? So that anger doesn't have to stay with you. That jealousy, that whatever that is, that fear, that anxiety, that's a choice. And Epictetus talked about this is like, there's nothing objectively good or bad out there. It's just the stories we tell them ourselves about those things. You're making me think, I wonder, when you look at CQC, close quarters combat, clearing a house, that is that meditative state where you're, you're yeah. not going to give into a bout of anger when you're clearing yeah. a room. You're in complete command. I almost wonder why 
in, in the teams or anywhere else, that same sort of awareness isn't cultivated in every other aspect of life. That's what you're talking about. 100%. Yep. That's worth thinking about. Yep. All right, what's number two? I think many people would benefit from reading Thinking Fast and Slow. <laughs> Daniel Kahneman, yeah. Daniel Kahneman. I don't know that people realize, many people realize the cognitive biases are inherent to our operating system. They're always back there kind of moving. And once you start to realize that oh, I am biased in a number of different ways, right? Recognition is the first part. Then realizing that we can do something about those biases, mm -hmm. whatever the, what are the cognitive fallacies are. But I think that was an eye-opening book for me just to go, oh, I, you know, I'm not the rational decision maker that I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah, that's a classic. Last one? Yeah. Yeah. 4,000 Weeks. I've never heard of this. Oliver Berkman. Um, this goes back to what I talked about as far as you know, the vast majority of what we do is ultimately unimportant, right? So how do we think about how we use our time? 4,000 Weeks refers to the, the average lifespan of a human. How do we think about the time that we have on this planet, right? And is it just to increase productivity, right? There's like these, all these fads about productivity, increasing productivity. How would we do more? And the idea in that book is, yeah, you can do more in less time, but then they're just going to fill that with more work to do. But what do we, how do we actually think about what's important? Whether the thing we're doing is moving the needle and how we want to spend the rest of our lives. So I've been debating on like including asking this question. I think I've only asked it once, but given like the arc of this conversation, the, the 12 years old, the chasing that, that last thing I ever do, all three books you had were about being aware That's it. of life, of what, what, what the hell are we doing here? So like, if you had like a, a billboard, what is one thing you would pass on as a bit of wisdom from everything you've gained? Try to understand the nature of mind. At the end of the day, our, the quality of our life is a function of the quality of our thoughts. And if you can learn to understand the thoughts that you're having when they present themselves, ultimately, I think you, that's the key to living a more fulfilling life. Last question. One person, dead or alive, who would you want to have a conversation with? Hemingway. 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 After everything we just talked about, why Hemingway? Hemingway. One of my favorite writers. Interesting. Uh, it's an interesting character, too. You've studied his history uh, and what he did. He had his hands in a lot of different things, right? And I just think he would be an interesting person to, to have a beer with. Uh, rock and roll. All right. Anything else you want to add? That's it, man. Appreciate the time. Appreciate it. Thanks, dude. That's it for this episode. If you want to check out more from the podcast, head to zeroeyes.com slash Nobel, where you can see show notes, read more about our guests, and suggest guests or topics of your own. Until next time, stay in the fight. Don't ring the bell.